Project family, welcome back to our series in the book of Romans. If you are new here or if you missed the other talks, let me give you a summary of what we've seen so far. The book was written by Paul, a religious person who persecuted the Church of Christ until the day he met Jesus face to face and he realized that he was not pleasing God but actually working against God. Jesus, instead of punishing Paul, he chose Paul to be one of his apostles, someone sent out with a mission. Paul was meant to proclaim the gospel, the good news. He wrote a letter to a church in Rome, a church made of Jews and Gentiles, a multicultural church converted to Christianity. And Paul wanted them to be reminded of the good news. The thing is, in chapter 1, especially from verse 18 and to chapter 2, um, uh, chapter 3, verse 20, uh, Paul only shares bad news. He says that God is angry with mankind. Paul says that we human beings are all sinners. There is not, not one who is just with before God. And he says that we all deserve to be punished we all deserve death for all eternity in hell. But from chapter 3, verse 21, Paul is started to share the good news with us. He says that Jesus, God himself, came to earth. He became flesh. He dwelled among us. He lived a perfect life. He obeyed the law with perfection. He did what we could never have done. And that was important because his perfect life gave him the right to die a perfect death on our behalf. His sacrificial death on the cross gave us the opportunity to be forgiven. Jesus on the cross satisfied God's anger. And God being just, he wanted to see someone paying for sin and God himself did that for us because he's just but also because he loves us my question is is there anything we need to do to be forgiven is there anything we need to do to go to heaven was Jesus sacrificial death on the cross sufficient to declare us right with God well, today we're going to study Romans chapter 4, from verse 1 to verse 25. In order to answer this question, I need you to understand what justification is. How are we declared before God? How are we declared right before God? So my aim here is to clarify what is justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And my hope is that by the end of it, um, we may get the answer of this question, but also that you may find out whether you have saving faith or not. You might be someone who is still struggling um, with this question. You might not have the assurance that you are saved. So today I want to explain what justification is according to the Bible so that you can find out whether you are saved or not. So let me start by pointing something important about justification. Justification is apart from works, from good deeds, from good actions. Let's read verse 1 to 8 to see how Paul explains that. Here's what he says. He starts with Abraham. Someone very important to the Jewish nation. Someone very important to this church in Rome. He says, Abraham was, humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? Excellent question. What did Abraham discover about being justified by God? Verse 2. If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. 
Did he have something to boast about? Not at all. He was a sinner. But that was not God's way. Verse 3, for the scriptures tells us, Abraham believed God. Abraham had faith in God. And God counted him as righteous because of his faith, because of his belief, and not because of his good deeds. Paul, he is quoting Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, where God makes this important statement that Abraham was declared right with God because of his faith. And in verse 4 and 5, Paul gives us a nice illustration to help us to understand what he means by that. He asks, uh, he says, when people work, their weights are not a gift. Yeah, when you go to work, you want to get paid. So your employer is not giving you a gift when he pays for, for your work. He's actually paying your weights. You deserve that. But something they have earned. Verse 5. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work. So when we are talking about justification, um, we are not justified by our work. People are counted as righteous with God, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God, who forgive sinners. In verse 6, Paul is going to mention somebody else very important to the Jews, especially to this church in Rome. He says, David also is spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Let me repeat it. Without working for it. Here's what uh, David said in Psalm chapter 32, verse 1 and 2. Oh, what a joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what a joy for, for those whose record the Lord has cleared of sin. So, in summary, what does Paul mean? Well, here's my assumption. Paul basically said that Abraham and David were not justified by good deeds, by good actions, by good work. On the contrary, if you know who Abraham is, if you know who David is, according to the scriptures, you're going to realize they both were sinners who relied only on the good work of God to be justified by faith. They did not rely on their actions. Just to give an example of how sinful they were, David, for instance, if you check 2 Samuel chapter 11, you're going to see that he was a murderer. He committed adultery. And that's why he's very happy to know that God does not make us right based on our good deeds. Because the reality is we would never have Deeds enough to be accepted by God. Never. We are always missing the target. We are always sinning. And what is the lesson here for us? Well, based on what Paul said, the idea of karma or merit or, or the things that you do that um, counts, counts you as someone who can be justified by God based on your good deeds. Um, that idea that whatever you do will come back to you, either in this life or the next, is unbiblical. You are not justified by your good deeds. You're not justified by what you do. Therefore, our good deeds are important, but not important to save us. According to Isaiah, our good deeds before God are like filthy rags. Let me read Isaiah 60, 64, verse 6 for you to give you an idea of how filthy our, our um, works are for God. He says in verse 6, 
we are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. When we try to show God our good actions, our good deeds, our good work, because His standard is extremely high, God looks at it and He only sees a filthy rag. Because I know there are kids watching that with adults, I want you parents to try to explain, um, to articulate what the filthy rag is in this context to your kids using the language that you find it more appropriate. But one thing I can tell you kids, when God says that our good deeds are filthy rags, He's saying it is disgusting. Even our good actions before God, when we try to use it to justify ourselves, God sees that as a thing unpleasant. So here's my question for all of us. If you died tonight and God said, why should I let you into my heaven? Would you say, because I have tried my best to be good? Well, Paul has already said here to us that we are not saved by good works, right? So we are not justified, we are not declared right with God because of our good works. Our good works are filthy rags. So we are not saved by good works. So what is justification? Well, let's read verse 9 to 12 to understand something important about justification. Justification is a part of from good works, but also from outward signs. Let me read for you. Verse 9. Now, is this blessing only for the Jews, or is it also for uncircumcised Gentiles? Is that only for a specific group of people, but, or for everybody? Well, we have been saying that Abraham was counted as righteous but God because of his faith. Verse 10. But how did this happen? Was he counted as righteous only after he was circumcised or was, he, was it before he was circumcised? Good question. And to give the answer is that um, circumcision is, is an outward a sign made by the Jews um, um, with the males on the seventh day of their lives. So after seven days, parents need to circumcise their male children. And that was a sign they belonged to the Jewish nation. And Paul says, clearly God accepted Abraham before he was circumcised. So before circumcision, even was um, something the Jews observed. Abraham was justified before the circumcision. Circumcision was a sign that Abraham already had faith and that, that God had already accepted him and declared him to be righteous, even before he was circumcised. So he's uh, making sure the Jews of that church understand Abraham was not made right because of circumcision. Abraham was not justified because of this outward sign. On the contrary, he was justified by faith. So Abraham is the spiritual father of those who have faith but have not been circumcised. They are counted as righteous because of their faith. And Abraham is also the spiritual father of those who have been circumcised. But only if they have the same kind of faith Abraham, Abraham had before he was circumcised. Well, this is key in this passage. He's saying that it doesn't matter whether you were circumcised or not. What is important? Well, in, the important thing is faith. Faith in God. So, what does Paul mean here? Well, 
Although the Jews saw circumcision as the sign of membership in the Jewish nation and as a symbol of belonging to God, Abraham was made right by faith. Before he was even circumcised, in other words, he was not justified because he was a Jew. So, Paul was not uh, Abraham was not justified because of circumcision. He was not justified because he was part of the Jewish nation. Abraham was justified by faith. And it's interesting because uh, not many people know, but Abraham was actually not a Jew, but a pagan. He, he was um, called by God um, in a pagan nation. He was from Ur of Chaldeus um, in, in the Mesopotamia. And Abraham probably worshipped um, an idol before God even chose him, before God even justified Abraham. He probably worshipped the moon as that was the common practice of that time. So Abraham was not justified because he belonged to the Jewish nation. He was not justified because he, he had outward signs that could join him to God's family. That was not how he got justified. He got justified by faith. And here's a question I want us all to reflect. If you die tonight and God said, why should I let you into my heaven? Would you say because of my affiliation to a local church? Maybe through baptism, maybe through the Lord's Supper, maybe through a membership class, maybe by getting married in a church, maybe by, by, by going to a Bible study. Is that, is that what you're going to say to, to God? Because based on what Paul said, outward signs don't establish our lineage to Abraham. <laughs> it's, not, it's not through outside, uh, outward signs that we are going to belong to this spiritual family of God. Therefore, our spiritual lineage is not based on baptism, membership, or the Lord's Supper. But the same faith that Abraham had, we are going to be made right before God, not by being baptized as a child, as the Roman Catholic Church hates. Let me actually tell you something very important. You can be baptized as a baby in a church. You can go to a church for your entire life. You can... Um, become a leader of a church. You can get married in a church. You can have your funeral in a church. But without faith in Christ, you are going to head to hell. We are not saved. We are not justified by outward signs. These outward signs, they just, they just... Um, they are just a picture of something that happened inside of us. So whatever we do outside, they are just a picture. They are just a sign. This ring here does not make me merit. <laughs> this ring here is just a sign of a commitment that I made before God with my wife to be united with her unto death set us apart so the wedding ceremony the wedding ring they're just signs they are not the marriage in itself so we are not saved by outward signs so what is justification all about alex well thirdly justification is apart from the law so justification is apart from good good work it's a apart from outward signs, and it's also apart from the law. Let's read verse 13 and 16. To 16. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham 
and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. Wow, this is really important. So, uh, the law is important, but you only obey the law properly when you do it with with the right relationship with God, with the right motivation. Verse 14, if God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is unnecessary and the promise is pointless. If you're saved by obeying the law, there is no reason for Jesus to, to come. There is no reason for Jesus' death. Verse 15, for the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. In other words, the reality is the law cannot save you. The law only shows how sinful we are. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. Verse 16, so the promise is received by faith. It is, it is given as a free gift grace and we are all certain to receive it whether or not we live according to the law of Moses if we have faith like Abraham's for Abraham is the father of all who believe and just to highlight something important here when God chose Abraham when God made him right by faith there was no law Okay, the law given by Moses was something developed many years later. So again, Paul is trying to show that we are not saved by obeying the law, although the law is very important. So what does Paul mean? Well, Paul um, was basically saying that the law did not, cre not, did not credit to Abraham any righteousness since he was made right before the law was given. As I said, Abraham was made right by God before the Mosaic law was created and given to um, the Jews. Abraham's righteousness was by grace, a free gift, through faith, not by law keeping. It was not by obeying the law. And again, the law is just, is just a reflection, it's just a picture, it's just a, a kind of TV that shows how sinful we are. If you try to keep the law, you're going to realize that um, no matter how hard you try to keep it, you are always going to fail. Because this is the point of the law. The law was not given to help us to get right before God, but to show us that we can't get right with God unless, unless we rely on the sacrifice of His Son on the cross. So, another question. If, if you die tonight and God said, why should I let you into my heaven? Would you say, because I believe in God and I try to obey His commandments. Oh, I heard that many, many times. And it gets me, I feel extremely sad when I hear that. Because um, it is really important to obey the law. But unless you obey it with perfection, you are going to be condemned. So... Based on what Paul said, the saved person does not trust in obedience as a way to be saved. However, so ju ju just, just to highlight something here. Um, Paul wrote this letter and this letter was the letter that opened Martin Luther's eyes. And wh who was Martin Luther? Well, he was one of the people behind the Reformation. So, um, Martin Luther was a monk, someone who hated God because he tried to work hard. 
he tried to obey the Lord so he could get right with God. And he punished himself. He confessed his sins many times in order to be forgiven. He worked hard, hard and hard. But no matter what he did, he always failed to obey the law with perfection. To obey the Bible fully. However, one day, preparing a lesson in the book of Romans, his eyes were open. He realized that it's not by obeying the law that we are saved. We don't need to do anything to be saved because Jesus did everything. Does that mean we don't need to obey the Bible, does that mean we don't need to be obedient to Jesus' commandments? No. So, um, however, a saved, uh, a saved person is not the one who rejects or disregards the law, but the one who stops obeying it to be saved. So, you're, you're not justified by obeying the law, but the law is still, is, is still important to us. And here's what Luther said. We are saved by faith alone. Keep this in your mind. We are saved not by good deeds, not by outward signs, not by obeying the law. We are saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves is never alone. This, the faith that saves is never alone. So if you will study with us the book of James, James actually chapter 2, he's going to mention Abraham as well. And he's going to say that Abraham was justified by his obedience. What does he mean? Is that a contradiction? No, it's not a contradiction. James is writing to Christians who are not, who are, who are disregarding, disregarding obedience disregarding the law so he was trying to explain to them you can't have a dead faith you can't have a demonic faith you have you need to have a fruitful faith it's not about having an intellectual faith it's not about having a a a, a, a kind of conviction that does not move you to do good deeds to obey the law so, we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. So, we are not saved by trying to keep the law. So, what is justification? Well, justification is by faith alone. It's not by doing good deeds. It's not by... Uh, by having outward signs. It's not by obeying the law. It's just by accepting Jesus' sacrifice on the, cro on the cross. Let's read verse 17 to 25. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Verse 18, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping. <laughs> so I don't know if you know that, but God promised to Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations. But when he said that, Abraham was over the age of 90. And it took a long time to that promise to be fulfilled. But Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you, that's how many descendants you will have. 19. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though, at about 100 years old uh, years of age, he figured his body was as good as that, as an old person. He could see that he would, he would not be able to be a father. 
And so was Sarah's womb. In other words, she was also old and she knew it's impossible to get pregnant at this age. Verse 20, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. By believing in God, by trusting God, by having faith in God, not in himself. He brought glory to God. Verse 21. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. God can bring life to the dead and create new things out of nothing. He can keep his promises because he is God. He's so powerful. Verse 22. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. So maybe you might be wondering, um, how did Abraham got saved if he, if he had no idea um, how Jesus' death would, be, would, would save him as we know now. Hell, because he's, he was counted right before God by believing in the information he had at that time. So what does all, all that mean to us? Well, Paul was basically saying that Saving faith is not a perfect life without sin. Saving faith is not perfection, okay? Saving faith is, is, is the justification um, that declares you right with God because you believe in the work of Jesus, the perfect work of Jesus, the perfect life He lived, the perfect death, sacrificial death. He died on our behalf. It is a life which relies entirely on what God has said He would do. He promised to save those who put their trust in Christ alone. So we are justified by faith. But faith is not the object. Jesus is, is the man by which we are saved. It is by believing in Jesus. But as I said before, this belief can be theoretical. This is dead faith. This belief can be demonic. The demons believe in Jesus. They have the conviction uh, that Jesus can save. However, they do not repent. Their minds, their hearts, the mind of a demon, the mind of Satan, has not been changed. So saving faith is the belief that changes our minds and our hearts. And as a result, we do good deeds. As a result, we obey the law. As a result, we have outward signs, such as baptism, church membership, the Lord's Supper. So we need to put our trust in. And Jesus. I said that many, many times. My grandmother, she would love to come to London. But although she understands that a narrow plane, this heavy metal thing can fly, she doesn't have faith in it. She doesn't put her trust in an aeroplane. That's why she refuses to come. She doesn't trust the aeroplane. So she has theoretical faith. But she doesn't put her trust. She doesn't believe in it. So what are the implications of it for us as a church? Let me finish by reading verse 23 to 25. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for, God, for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too. Assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in Him. Oh, this is good news. We are declared right with God by believing in Him. The one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. 
he was handed over to die because of our sins and he was raised to life to make us right with God. This is good news. This is justification by faith alone. We are not saved by our good works, outward signs, or by keeping the law. And here's the big idea I want you to keep in your mind. Saving faith is trusting in Jesus alone. Don't try to add anything. Jesus' life and death on the cross on our behalf, our, as a, our representative, was sufficient. Don't try to add anything to your salvation. Just accept it for free. Just believe because it is not by our good deeds. It is not by our outward signs. It is not by obeying the law that we are saved. Saving faith is trusting Jesus alone. Let me repeat this. And I need you to understand that. Because that, that is what makes Christianity different from all the other religions. The major religions will tell you, you need to do something to be saved. You need to work to be saved. Christianity says, saving faith is trusting Jesus alone. You do nothing to be saved. You just accept it and not on ourselves. Don't rely on yourself to be saved. Rely on the work of Jesus. He lived a perfect life. He died a perfect death for us. Rely on His work. Trust Him. So, saving faith is faith not based on our works or on the comprehension of the facts about the gospel of Jesus Christ, but on trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Let's try to apply everything here now to our lives. What difference does being justified by faith make? What difference does that make in your life? And I said, one of my hopes for this talk was to help you to search your heart. Now that you know that you're not saved by good deeds, you're not saved by obeying the law, you're not saved by getting baptized in the church, by getting married in the church, by confessing your sins in the church, by having the Lord's Supper in a church, now that you know that you're saved by faith alone, what difference does that make in your life? Does justification by faith motivate you now to do good works, but with the right reason? In gratitude. Does justification by faith motivate you to belong to Jesus? In other words, to belong to Jesus' family. Because when you are changed from inside out, then you can start having these outward signs. So if you believe that Jesus alone is the means by which you can be saved, have you been baptized? If you understand that it's important to obey the law, why are you waiting to get married? <laughs> if you understand that um, Jesus accomplished all the work that we would never be able to accomplish. Why are you still refusing to accept it? Does justification by faith motivate you to obey Jesus? You see, um, we are justified by faith alone. And when we are justified, we believe and repent. Our mind is changed. Our heart is changed. And we have this deep desire to obey Jesus, to obey his commandments. If you have been justified, you have this desire to obey him. Let me give a, one example on how you could obey him. He says in Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, teaching them to obey, teaching them to obey, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded them. Are you being obedient if you have been truly saved? If you have no desire to obey Jesus, you need to ask yourself one important question. Am I still trying to earn my salvation? Am I truly saved? Because true salvation changes you in a such a way that you don't need someone to tell you, go out of your comfort zone. Make disciples by, by sharing the good news with your relatives, your friends, on the street. Make disciples of all nations. Don't make this, don't, 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 don't favor some kind of people. Embrace anyone. Even though those you might think, oh, I don't like, I don't like that kind of people. Baptizing them. <laughs> Why are you waiting to get baptized? What is stopping you? And obeying all the law and helping others to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. This is a spiritual growth. Do you desire to obey in order to grow, to become more like Jesus? This is just one of the commandments Jesus asked us to obey. And I'm going to stop here because I really want you to reflect about it. Does justification by faith motivate you to do good, motivate you to belong to Jesus' family, motivate you to obey Jesus? Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because today Paul helped us to understand that we are saved by faith alone, by grace alone, in Christ alone. This is really important, Father. And we come before you in gratitude, knowing that we are sinners who deserved death, eternal separation, hell. But you, being a God full of love and at the same time fair and just, you came to die, to satisfy your own anger on yourself for our benefit. Help us to rely on your work. Help us not to think that we have to do anything to be saved, Father. And as we are justified, I pray that you motivate us to do good works, to have outward um, signs, and to obey you, not to get saved, but in gratitude for what you have done for us. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope to see you soon. I pray that God may bless you. And I hope you have a great week. Goodbye.